My name is Doug Morrison. I'm the strategic head for the modern workplace business within Braintree. Braintree is a wholly owned subsidiary of Vox. We are the Microsoft house uh, and the Microsoft uh, know-how that assists Vox to deploy and assist our customers uh, in that space. So welcome to everybody. Um, so the last sentence at the end of the day is, um, is we, we are recording the session um, I'm going to introduce you to the different speakers um, and then we're going to start uh, discussing. If you have questions, please ask them either in the chat, uh, put up your hand, uh, we'll reference back to you, please ask the questions. The idea here is that we actually transfer knowledge. Um, I think from our side, obviously, we are Braintree. Uh, Braintree is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Vox. Um, and we are the Microsoft uh, product uh, people in the Vox environment. So. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy the session. Our agenda is going to be as follows. We're going to go through a little bit of dispelling some of the rookie mistakes in security. We're going to talk around the Microsoft security strategy. We're going to talk uh, around some of the Braintree uh, security tool sets, but we're going to really start that at a fundamental level. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit around a couple of the options available through some Q&A uh, amongst the panel uh, at the end. And then we'll just do a wrap up and, and call uh, call to, to action. So to that end. Uh, you've been muted again, Doug. Doug, you've been muted. Every time I change the slide, I mute myself. That's pretty impressive. I'm going to have to figure out how that's working. Anyway, guys, I'd like to introduce you to, uh, to uh, three gentlemen. Um, they form the basis of our uh, security practice for now. Uh, Rian Kruger uh, is a Microsoft Solution Assessment Specialist for Middle East and Africa. He specializes in cybersecurity and cloud infrastructure assessments. Uh, Koresh Ramlal, uh, four years in cybersecurity industry with experience in penetration testing, digital forensics, and data privacy. And then last but not least, my colleague and friend, uh, and a technology geek, avid skydiver, been in technology for about 26 years, covering the development, cloud, architecture, uh, head of IT for various companies, including Braintree, CIO, and now all things Microsoft. Welcome, gentlemen. I'd like to hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much for agreeing to participate. Thank you, Doug. Uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, so uh, we, we're kicking off on this, um, Rian uh, Kurash, but I think, uh, Rian, more with yourself. We've done, I think, in the tens of cybersecurity assessments together with, vari with various customers. Um, uh, I'm sure on your side with other customers, um, it must be in the hundreds of cybersecurity um, assessments that have been done from, from your side. Um, it's been it's been a very insightful and a very, very, very good, good pr uh, process and procedure to go through in terms of the assessment, what we've seen coming out from that. But I guess there are some few trends and uh, four salient points that um, is, is presented on the screen now. And I think the first thing I want to touch on, Rian uh, Karash, um, is there's a conception or uh, the perception, um, the perception out there that um, hackers require skills and that they they sit in front of these um, big servers and there's lights flashing everywhere and they've got Linux boxes and they're about to go in. Is that is that myth? Is it a myth or is it a fallacy or is it the actual truth that you need that uh, type of skill to get into a uh, customer's environment? Sure, Chris, uh, I, I'll take this one here. So yeah. uh, I think we'd all love to think that all of the hackers out there executing these type of attacks have years of software develop ex development experience, uh, but unfortunately not. Hey, uh, I met very few guys over the years uh, who, as they classify, see the code, <laughs> uh, but the reality of it is that the growth of cybersecurity attacks against organizations is due to a marketplace of cyber attacks that are available out there. And I think the best way for me to demonstrate this to you guys is a very brief you know, demonstration of actually how easy it is to compromise a user's credentials. And again, the users are the weakest link in our environment. We cannot prevent or protect ourselves if our users are giving those credentials away. And I'm gonna be a bit of a guinea pig and I'm gonna use myself as a, 
as an example here. And you have to forgive me. This was before my days in cybersecurity. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure that's a good idea? Eh? <laughs> Go for it. Excellent. So I'm just going to share my screen here and. What we're going to go to is a website called Have I Been Caught? Now, this is a publicly list, a website that publicly lists uh, essentially breaches that are out there within the dark web. It's not a list of all the leaks, but it potentially will alert any user if their credentials or email has been compromised in the past, right? So it's a fantastic means for me personally to check if my credentials uh, have been leaked in the past. But it's also an excellent means for any attacker out there to also check as well. And I mean, at the end of the day, all they need to start this attack is an email address. It's your name and your email address. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of go through the motions about doing this as I'm going to enter my Gmail address there. And as you can imagine, with many users at the time, right, I have a password and I have a habit of using that password on multiple accounts, whether it's been work or private, especially if my work doesn't require me having, uh, let's say, uh, periodic resets or anything like that, you know, to further protect me. So after doing a search on myself, I've seen that I actually was compromised back in 2013 as well as uh, in 2017, right? And what was compromised uh, in these attacks were my email and my passwords and my password hints right? My usernames, as well as in the second account, the same type of information. I want to clarify here that this is not me, you know, clicking a link or anything like that. I had subscribed to a, a customer service or a client, you know, out there, and th that customer was breached. You know, in fold, my data was leaked publicly to the dark web. Sure. Now, this is an excellent thing for me to kind of go ahead and reset my passwords, but what happens if someone decides to target me, right? And I use the same password on this account on multiple others right? how do I go about it? So there are marketplaces that are out there, and this is one of the ones that are just kind of publicly available. Uh, this is set up for ethical hackers, but again, there's nothing preventing anyone with malicious means from going to this website and trying to execute. So what I can do is I can come to raid forums and I can say, let's try and find that database. And if I scroll down a tiny bit, what do you know? Here's an Adobe leak from 2013 with 152 million records leaked. My personal data is lying within this leak. So if I decided to pay $5 on this website, I could purchase that data and I could have access to it. So, you know, it goes back to saying, you know, how easy it is to kind of execute an attack or try and do an account takeover as simple as Googling at the end of the day. You know, there's marketplaces out there and I could go into it further. I mean, uh, this website here, you could actually hire uh, attackers. Oh, for some reason, it doesn't think I'm a human. <laughs> because it's because you're a cybersecurity specialist. <laughs> <laughs> so while you're finding it, uh, Kirash, isn't it? You know, what I what I do with my Gmail accounts is I use it to log into various other sites. And you know, like with, yep. um, so effectively, if they've got my Gmail um, email and uh, password, they've actually got access to. 10, 12 other services that I've used my Gmail. Exactly. To, to and I mean, we, we have those things where a lot of the sites say, you know, for convenience, why don't you just uh, use your Google account on our service? And this yeah. is why, you know, whether it's on a corporate or personal level, MFA or, you know, that extra step OTP authentication is critical because you can see how easy it is for us to, uh, you know, get those leaked credentials. It also goes back to your email protection because once the at attacker has established itself, himself, uh, within an environment or taken over an account, how easy it for them is it easy it is for them to move to other machines or try and send malicious software to other users within that environment. So again, just uh, while we managed to get through that, you can see that this is a marketplace for data leaks, software tools, ransomware. You could hire ethical hackers if you like. The list goes on. So really, if you want to execute an attack, it is not that difficult at all. Great to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks. Thanks. James, for that. I think I think what scares me is that this is not like highly skilled people enabling this uh, environment anymore. What concerns me is the fact that you know it can be a student at school, somebody with a bit of spare time, like a varsity guy, you know, yeah. or yeah. if you've made somebody angry in your organization and they've left, it could be initiated by somebody like that. 
It really is a worrying factor. So I'm glad that their tool sets that assist us to actually start closing this down. Anyway, I'll get back over to you. Q, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you, you mentioned one thing because there's one thing that we advise our customers on, um, customers, even if you're not a customer, I think the, the, the cardinal rule here is enable your multi-factor authentication. If there's anything that you get from today's session, um, I mean, there's a bunch of other tools in the Microsoft set that can be used to protect your mail and your identity management and the likes, but I think step number one is what you said is um, activate MFA. We can't say that enough to our customers. Because once that part, once that part is compromised, there's no other step to protect it. All right, um, Doug, I just want to be able to represent again. Um, but uh, Rian, um, you, you know, I think another perception that's out there at the moment um, is that it's only the, you know, the, the big guys, the banks and the, you know, the apps or the FMBs, uh, even the larger corporates that are um, with the with hackers and um, you know the ransomware attacks are coming uh, are targeting enterprise enterprises only you rather say um, you know a fallacy myth um, or truth <laughs> um, I think uh, Chris yeah thanks thanks for you and the team for just hosting us and uh, making us part of this um, um, so um, yeah I think you know, we've gathered from the assessments and we've done enterprise SMC, SMB, we get all these customers all the time. And uh, the truth really is um, hackers know that enterprise is big money, right? But big money can buy big security as well. And that's the reality. So the SMBs really fall victim. And I mean, the reality is um, if we go look at the statistics, just uh, from what the National Cyber Security Alliance says, uh, one out of five businesses, SMBs, small businesses, get hacked yearly. So, and the reality from that is that 60% of those businesses go out of business within six months after they've been hacked. And I think COVID is a, was a very good illustration of just how vulnerable a small business is. They don't have the capital to keep them going for three, four months without any income. So it's really important for, for us to, to focus on this. And I think that's where you guys make such a big difference in uh, you know, supporting SMBs. And I think the things that we noticed uh, that hackers do focus on is the fact SMBs don't have uh, uh, certain things in place. And if I could just start out and mention a few of them, I think um, the first one would be something like unsecure devices. If you think about uh, us using our cell phones, I mean, most companies would allow me to come in with my smartphone. I work for the company. It's a small business. They're not going to be able to afford a 20,000 Rand phone or a 15,000 Rand or a 10,000 Rand phone. They would say, hey, you know what? Just use your smart device. We're going to enroll you in the system, depending on how knowledgeable they are with uh, Defender. Do they have Defender? Do they have Intune? We don't know, but mostly they don't. And the reality is they allow a user to access company information on a personal device. So the reality of this is, even on a laptop, a hacker doesn't need to then sort of break the, the, the company credentials. All you need to do is just break into that phone. And you're using that phone for all kinds of other stuff. So there's one big vulnerability is unsecured devices. Um, other thing we can focus on is uh, the value of personal data. So hackers know, and I mean, Q has actually just shown that, how valuable is uh, information? SMBs are a wealth of information. They store information from customers. So they've got credit card details, they've got uh, addresses, cell phone numbers, email addresses. All these things are valuable. Data is a commodity these days. So the reality is, if they break into these small companies, they don't necessarily have to do uh, damage to that business. They can take that data and go sell it on the web. Yeah. $50, $20, doesn't matter. Somebody's going to go come and buy that information like you just showed you. There's a nice marketplace. They post it on there. We've got information for these guys or these guys or this database. It's up for sale. They make money. So for these guys, it's easy money. Small business is easy money. Um, so that's another thing. Um, I think if we can also talk about um, the reason why small business is so vulnerable is because of the fact that we don't spend on resources or we don't have enough money to actually spend on resources. And I think that's where we get a big problem. You know, the poor guys are uh, overworked. And, and I mean, from our assessments, we've gathered that it's not just that we take, if we say small business, I mean, if I say 20 guys in a company, that's small. If we talk um, 700, we sort of getting to SMC C level. And we've had some of these customers where I personally worked with assessments where I was struggling with one customer to get hold of him, to assist me, to start this assessment for them. 
And uh, I eventually sent an email to the guy saying, hey, do you mind just, you know, passing this on to one of your uh, your, your subordinates? You probably have like a whole bunch of IT guys running around you, about 700 people. And he replied to me about three days later saying, listen, I don't know uh, what your perspective is of our company. I am IT, one guy. So you see what I mean when I say, when I talk about resources, it's really one of the things that, first of all, how many people do you have? And to what skill level um, are they are they trained? That's really important. Okay, so spend a little bit of money. It's going to go a long way because that's where your vulnerability is. And then something else we may, uh, we notice a lot. If we do scan, uh, we can see all the operating systems. You know, all the things that we see on customers' um, uh, infrastructure. One thing that we pick up a lot is legacy uh, uh, software. And the the problem with this is you get a lot of software that's not supported anymore, and these create vulnerabilities. And the, the reality is, is that in the short term, you're going to save money, yes, because you're not upgrading licenses. But the reality is that can close your business. If somebody hacks you and you've got ransom software on your, on your network, that is going to close your business. Um, I don't know if people are aware of the uh, WannaCry ransom attack that happened some years ago. Statistically, when they investigated that case, around 98% of the impacted computers were still running Windows 7. And that, that's the reality. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Things that we see, um, unknown, sh unknown shares are detected when we do scans. Like you guys don't even know about that. Admin account management. Admin account management, um, you know, some guys are using their company credentials to log into their social or whatever media or even Adobe, you know, like we just saw. You log with your company information, use that on the Adobe website. It's a well-known company. Boom, you get hacked because they were hacked. Your credentials are now vulnerable. So these are some of the things that we see. And then going back to legacy, uh, legacy protocols as well. We see SMBV1, uh, old protocols that are still uh, active on company networks. And then also uh, disabled firewalls. I mean, we're working from home. People are taking their laptops home, but firewalls are disabled on devices. I mean, these are just like, it's, it's quick wins if you know about them. But it's just, you know, people don't don't seem to to look into those things. So these are the things that we sort of pick up from uh, from our assessments, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant feedback. Thank you. And I think I think if I can add to that, in um, you know, from the assessments and the reports that are coming out from the CSAT assessments, particularly, is you know, um, it gives you, um, you know, exactly what to do and in what time frames to do as well. So, but yeah. my my strongest uh, my strongest um, you know uh, insights that I've got from customers' um, um, assessments exactly is that that roadmap. If you if you um, want to remediate this vulnerability, so for instance, the unknown shares or um, orphan accounts, um, take it, take it, um, take this approach and use this tool um, to um, to remediate that vulnerability and to increase that posture. I think also just in terms of what you're saying with the one IT and uh, the one IT guy, um, you know, the, the assessments and, and the wealth of information that provides that organisation, um, it, it takes it well beyond that. But, but, but thank you for thank you for that. Right. So just moving on to, and, we, and we've spoken about this now uh, comprehensively, and, and and you know it's the, it's the, um, it happens. Uh, it, it, um, you're not protected, and um, you get encrypted. Um, you get your um, your icons on your on your server screens, or um, somebody's clicked on a phishing attack or a spoof. You know, um, reacted to a spoof. The operational impact of um, that and the cost to um, recover um, regarding the downtime on that. OK, we've got a, we've got a time check here. Oh, so yeah. just, so to, just briefly, uh, just yeah. let, me, let me just get to this one. Uh, you know, when we consider operational impact of a rans ransomware, for example, you know, if we consider enterprise, we can assume hopefully that they have some type of DR or business recovery BCM in place that will define how they can go about recovering that data, right? Now, as simple as you having the means of recovering from the attack, the impact to your organization does not does not unfortunately stop there, right? So let's say, for example, uh, you've been ransomware. It takes you a week now to recover. I've seen ransomwares occur within enterprises in which literally an organization does not have access to emails for a week or longer due to the extent of the compromise within that environment. Now, what is the reputational impact to your organization? You know, would you not being able to respond to customers for a week? You're obviously operating uh, at an operational cost, but it goes one step further when we talk about how it impacts, you know, small to medium businesses, because 
unlike the enterprise customers who can afford to take that financial hit right within their cash flow and stuff, uh, often a ransomware attack to an SMB customer can be critical to the extent of a company you know, closing their doors. And the reason for it is that they don't have that strategy or plan uh, on how to mitigate that attack or how to address that attack. So even if they have backups in place, it's not as simple as them you know, restoring internally. Now, if you can consider a small business being closed for a week, that could mean either their doors staying open or closed you know, permanently at the end of the day. Yeah. And it again, it goes one step further, and that is, uh, we, we consider uh, ransomware as something about financial impact in terms of someone trying to get us to pay for data to encrypt our software or further, you know, let's say, uh, you know, just causes uh, inconvenience. But there's actual value in our data in terms of our companies, right? In terms of our competitors, our competitors would love to get our customer list. Uh, anyone trying to start a new business competing with us would like the same as well. So there's extreme value in our data and the opportunity for us to exfiltrate data out of organizations still exists. So what happens if I get into your environment and I silently stay there and just slowly suck out all that valuable information? I could sell it for a pretty penny. I could use it to create greater profit. So, you know, operational impact goes well beyond just you recovering uh, your data in the event of an attack. Thanks, Gresh. Um, I think, I mean, if I have to ever sort of latch on to what you're saying there, is like, I mean, and I've seen, I've seen one particular customer now, now recently in December, and that lost um, the entire uh, entire pastel environment, could not recover from that. Still, still, still surviving, but uh, trying to generate um, invoices in quotes um, for months back so they can keep up on their, on their financial systems, you know. And that's, that's the most likely time that could be spent on, on your uh, evolving and building your business, you know. Um, I think um, I'm going to start closing up um, our discussion here. I've, I've, let's get my time checks from my from my moderators here in the team. We've got about three, <laughs> two or three minutes left. So I want to move on, um, uh, Rian Karash, and, and just in terms of um, closing closing out here, um, quick wins. We've, we, we've spoken about, um, you know, in two minutes' time, or if we can wrap it up in two minutes or three minutes, uh, quick wins. Um, what can we do now off the bat to um, to close the security gap that we have in the Microsoft estate um, or the digital estate? What would your recommendations be in terms of that? Sure, Chris. Uh, so, if we talk about something that most customers can easily, that is readily available for almost all customers, specifically within the cloud environment, we have the Azure and M365 Secure Score. So these are essentially, uh, let's say, an online assessment tool that assesses the configuration of your online environment, points out specific, let's say, weak points of vulnerabilities and advises how best to go about remediating it. So definitely advise all customers using those platforms to do some research into that. In terms of our experience through the assessments, uh, the products that we've seen that have the greatest coverage in terms of risk within the environment is obviously a Microsoft Endpoint Manager for enabling that secure baseline of devices. It's also the Azure Security Center for ensuring that the assets within the cloud are configured and secured accordingly. And then lastly, uh, for those customers who are relying on the Microsoft environment for delivering cloud apps, we also have Defender for cloud apps, which specializes in kind of addressing those components. So I think that from a very brief, uh, let's say high level overview, those are the things that the customers can look at and they will definitely assist them greatly. Thanks so much, Karash. Thank you, thank you very much. I want to close this off by, by just in terms of what I, what I um, regard as quick wins here as well. And number one, I said, we, we said it earlier, um, if you've got a Microsoft product, if you've got an Azure Active Directory, um, implement multi-factor authentication, get a vulnerability assessment running on your environment, um, or can speak to us about um, running a, a full cyber security assessment on your environment. Guys, your time has been um, valued and a lot of insights gained here. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over back to Doug to take us further. Thank you very much, team. I really appreciate this. It's lacquer to have kind of an informal discussion, but also transfer some of the knowledge, give some guidance and uh, and some go forward. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to uh, now uh, hand over to another special person. Um, let me just make sure that I can get the next slide up first. Uh, there we go. 
Um, I'm going to hand over to Colin Erasmus. Colin, uh, Colin currently heads up the Modern Workplace and Security Business Group at Microsoft South Africa. Colin's passion is to put the right digital tools uh, in the hands of the business to connect and support employees wherever they are to drive productivity and collaboration. And a key element of that is to make sure that they're secure enough to do it. Colin, thank you very much for agreeing to join us. I uh, appreciate it. Um, if you want to take ownership of the uh, of the screen, uh, please please do feel free. Perfect, uh, Doug. Thank you very much. I am sharing. Can I just get a thumbs up that you can see the screen? We can see it. Perfect. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, always love addressing uh, the the audience. And uh, a couple of things today. Um, one or two points uh, specifically around hybrid work and the security considerations for hybrid work and just some of the uh, some of the things that we're seeing in the cybersecurity industry. We did a survey with the IDC a while back in June um, and we'll share some of those results. In fact, it, it streamlines very nicely into what uh, Chris and the guys were saying. So just a couple of things around hybrid work, I think, which are which are critical. Um, this is definitely happening. Um, it's happening more and more. Um, actually, for that matter, Microsoft South Africa actually did a what we call the soft opening of our offices on Monday. Um, I don't know if it was specifically for Valentine's Day, but uh, nevertheless, we have a couple of people back in the office, which is good. A lot of our customers are now sitting in this hybrid work type environment, and I'm sure some of you that are on the call are as well. What we have picked up over the last while is is this thing that we're now calling the hybrid paradox. It's a bit of research that Microsoft was doing, so that Africa was included in the research. And it shows how people want to be connected. And, and you, you'll actually see on the screen at the moment the, the two stats there. And this is really where the, where the paradox comes, where people are saying, you can see 73% of the people are saying, I love this flexibility. I love being able to work from home. I love being able to potentially take a lunch and, and being able to take my kids to school. Um, but at the same time, almost very similarly, uh, the same sort of 67 or 70 percent of people are saying, but I miss that engagement. I miss those water cooler conversations, the collaboration. So we need to solve for this and we need to solve for this securely within the business. Microsoft came up with approach, what we were a new approach for us, and it's a new operating model that we are now using at Microsoft. And this is the way we set it out. Um, and I'll speak very highly at a high level about this, um, but people are really at the center of this now and, and it does beg uh, some questions around how and we engage our employees and what sort of uh, environment they sit in. But pe people are at the center of this now. The places is not necessarily what we would think. This is actually about the physical places that we now have. And remember, a person can have a place anywhere, and I'll show you the model in a second or, or just a, a, a deeper drill into, into the model. But places is about how we think about physically in our buildings now. So as some people go back to the office and some people potentially don't, um, how do we equip those places to make sure that everybody has a voice at the table and that everybody has a great experience? And for those of you that have been watching some of the developments around MTR, so Microsoft Teams rooms, you will see some of the technology that's been brought to bear there um, around sitting in a in a room and making somebody life size on the screen and the camera tracking technology to to track towards the individual. And you actually almost now have the old things in your car. We you used to have the stereo, you know, left or right, still, still have it today, but where you're now able to listen and hear where the people are coming from. And even things like when somebody writes on a board and collaborates, um, the cameras are actually on the inside of the board as opposed to somebody being in the way. Um, so that's what we mean about places. How do we enable those sorts of things? And then processes have become more important than, in it, than, than ever, especially people that may have had paper-based processes um, that were maybe physical sorts of processes. How do we automate those processes? Um, there's a lot of work going on around that and things. In fact, things like Power Automate and Power BI in Microsoft Solution Stack uh, are becoming exceptionally important. A lot of our customers reaching out to us. Let's just have a look at this a, a, in a little bit more depth and then I'll move on to the security stuff. We firmly believe that within this model, people are at the center um, and they've got three inputs into them. Um, so the, the first thing is the work site. Now, we all have a work site. That work site can be anywhere, and that's the way we need to think about it. It can be at home, it can be in a coffee shop, it can be physically back in the building. But we all have a work site, but that work site may differ and may vary, and may vary by, by time, and we'll get to that in a second. So that's the first thing to consider. It's the first thing to consider when we look at security as well. Work location 
everyone has a work location. Now, work locations become quite interesting. Obviously, in a small business, it's mostly a little bit different. But um, we have actually found under the pandemic at Microsoft, as an example, a lot of our people that used to be based in Johannesburg are no longer based in Johannesburg. <laughs> some of them have actually gone down to Cape Town, some of them have gone to Clarence, um, and that's become their physical and their permanent work location. Um, obviously, some job descriptions will allow you to do that. Other job descriptions may not allow you to do that, but everyone's got a work location. These things are going to be a bit different. This is why things like MFA and conditional access have become so important to make sure that we understand these work locations now and that we're checking for these sorts of things from a security standpoint. And then the last thing for us is working hours. Now that we've also seen everyone has working hours. These working hours are going to vary quite extensively in some cases, uh, and we've seen that in South Africa. Um, a lot of our customers are now going to shift work public sector are now on a rotational basis. Some of them are actually considering keeping that rotational basis and, and as small businesses we've seen that as well. So we believe these are all factors that we now need to think about in this new model um, and we have to embrace this by the way. I think we have to embrace this change um, and in, in fact there's a lot of research and it's called the, the work uh, index. So for those of you that want to go and have a look at this, the companies that have embraced this change and try to figure out how, how to work within this model um, are actually 80 uh, percent um, tend to be 80% more profitable than other organizations. So something to, to really think about. And by the way, some, some of the employees that are now joining our organizations are, are starting to dictate these sorts of things as well. So just some food for thought. Um, really what this does do though, so if we have employees at the center, or a person at the center, we do need to think about what this means from a well-being point of view and what this means from a technology point of view. And without spending too much time on it, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is what we believe the six inputs are into that um, person and their well-being. Um, and you'll, you'll, you'll see it there. And, and this is the way a lot of people are starting to think about where they go to organizations and, and what organizations have to offer. Um, and I'll go through one or two of them very briefly, but um, well-being, as you can imagine, that's about the, the physical, the emotional, the financial well-being of the individual and, and all those elements. When we talk about empowerment, a lot of that is about how do we empower that employee um, with what they need in order to meet their and your growth objectives. Um, and that is around how do we give them access to learning? It's around how we give them access to technology. Technologies like autopilot have been key during this period where I've got the ability to send somebody a notebook without having to come past IT um, and actually going straight to the door of the individual, especially if you're working in a hybrid environment and when they connect that device to the internet auto provisions. Um, so there's a lot of technology behind uh, a lot of this as well. And really our, our answer to this is Microsoft from a technology point of view was the Viva uh, product set. We actually call this our employee experience cloud. Um, that's actually what it's called. These technologies are all meant to drive what I just shown you from an employee point of view, all the way from connections, making sure that you're communicating effectively with your with your people inside your organization, um, to insights. Now, the insights gives you as an individual insights into your working day, and it gives individuals, your managers, and it gives the organization insight into the culture. Insights are not meant to be a tool to check up on your, on your employees. Are they working from eight to five? That's not the intent of the product. The intent of the solution solution is to give you a cultural view of, of people and actually help them to better themselves, i.e. How, how are they collaborating, who are they collaborating most with, are they collaborating after hours or online and after hours potentially and may not fit the culture of the organization. So every organization is going to have a different culture and that's really what it is. Um, learning is exactly what it says. Uh, the tool that streamlines it into teams now to help with the learning uh, path of an individual. Um, and the last one is topics is an AI generated engine that helps you empower people. So exactly that. So you, if you have a topic that you're not sure of, if you have a topic card, person can go to teams, go and look up the topic cards and the AI engine will then pull all the expertise, all the files, all the resources around that topic to, um, to the individual so that they can understand better what they're looking at. There's another module that's about to be added into Viva, which is really the KPI model, which is how we can actually help people track their performance. So just a bit of thinking around hybrid work and some of the changes that are going on. Maybe to switch gears around to security and you'll see the way these are going to dovetail into each other in a second. And um, Chris and the guys did a great job, I think, in explaining how this world has changed, how easy it is to get your hands on tools nowadays if you've got a couple of bucks on the dark web. But the fact of the matter is that the environment has changed drastically for us. Even prior to COVID, 
um, we saw a big change in the way we were transacting. And, and you know, di digital transformation um, led to a lot of that. You know, things like IoT, devi IoT devices. But we now need to think about where that information is stored. Is it secure? How's it going? So when I'm using my phone to pay, or when I'm using an NFC type device to pay, um, even the definition of employee, by the way, has changed drastically for us today. So we no longer have these firewall gated environments. We now have environments where we've got partners coming into our network to fulfill a service as an example we have bots within our network is is a bot considered an employee and, and how do we actually protect um your environment if you have a bot sitting on that environment and what is what does that look like byd has been around for a long time but we've got a a lot more devices coming so i mean I, the, the the really the environment has changed for us massively and i think it has led to a different way of thinking and i really do believe uh that very strongly that we are now in a security era of transformation. We've gone through digital transformation that happened five or six years ago and was on everyone's minds and everyone's lips. And the reason why we did that as an organization was enabled to to compete. And we spoke about the Ubers of the world um, and it really it made us think very differently about what we needed to do as organizations to compete. And it really was the digital transformation era. We're still going through it, but by no means are we over it. Cloud transformation enabled digital transformation in many ways. So we now needed to be able to compute a lot quicker. We needed computing power to expand, be elastic as we as we needed it and needed to be everywhere, needed to be secure. And then we saw a lot of cloud transformation going on. And you'll see some of the stats in a second. I really firmly believe we're now in a security transformation phase where these two pre previous periods of transformation has meant that we need to think very differently about our security. We need to think about the talent gap that potentially exists, and we know that there's a massive talent gap in security, uh, both from a technical point of view as well as from a cultural standpoint. So I really do think we're now in a security transformation phase and we need to think a little bit differently about security. And I think that has the the, the the slide before go to zero trust um this actually shows the the bit of research that we did in south africa in june and what you see is the um green graph is in two years time and the orange graph was now when we did the research and we asked customers what they were thinking where they were around cloud transformation and you'll see that in two years time if you take the hybrid approach as well as the exclusively in cloud approach over 90 percent of customers including small businesses um, are now saying to us they are absolutely going to go to cloud they want to be in cloud it gives them the security they need potentially and it gives them the less test the elasticity that they need so um just some food for thought the uh the cloud transformation is going to continue in a big way and and i think um we also asked during the survey we asked customers the question of where are you going to invest? And by the way, the survey was done across 200 um, individuals and 50% of the companies that were surveyed were small to medium type businesses. So from about 50 computers to about 300. Um, and this is what they came, this is, this is the results that they came back. And I must say, it's good to see the way people were thinking. And you'll see number one that came back was identities. Uh, Rihanna, the guys spoke about ident identities very specifically and MFA, and that's exactly what it is. How do we protect the identity? We can have the best security in the world. If we fail at identity, we, we're going to have tr troubles within our environment. And the next two or three that came back, I'll speak about very quickly. The, the second one, I think, was a result of what is going on in the country at the moment around Papier. Um, and really a lot of the thinking was around exactly that. How do I protect my customers' data, my own data from a privacy standpoint? The third uh, area of importance for customers or investment was around ransomware, how to protect myself against the types of attacks like ransomware. And then the fourth one was, even, was, was, was more interesting, or what was also interesting was seen, a lot of customers are thinking about how do I get an overall picture of my security um, landscape and posture um, from a SIEM perspective, because this is, it is fairly new, but if you think about it, there's no way one individual can look across the organization anymore. There's just too much happening. There's too many signals, and a lot of customers are going, how do I get that into one place that I can potentially look at that? So just some interesting re research has started coming out there. And you'll see further research that Microsoft did actually showed, and you know, we'll look at the top block, is that by protecting identities, that there was a 45% uh, less likelihood of a data breach inside the environment. So we can see that these sorts of things definitely help. It helps solve uh, and save on a lot of IT costs at the end of the day. So things like password resets as well. Um, so there's there's savings all the way and and better protection for yourself, especially if we start looking at identity. So I think Chris actually said it or Rian said it that you know if there's one thing, uh, actually think apologies, I think you said it. If there's one thing that you take away from this is MFA. So go and have a look at how you. Turn uh, MFA on inside your environment. 
when we look at security transformation, this is one of the other questions that we asked was, was how do you think about skilling inside your organization? And you'll see that over 50% of the respondents actually said that this is a major issue for them. They don't believe they have the right technical skills from a security standpoint or people that had the right cyber security knowledge. Um, and you'll see some initiatives from Microsoft shortly. There's a lot of resources on MS Learn. So for those of you that haven't looked at it, it, it is pretty much a free platform. Some of it is paid for, but a, a lot of what Microsoft puts up there is content that you can go and have a look at um, where you can actually go and do free learning on a specific topic or you can go and define a path for yourself. The other thing that came out very strongly was culture, was security culture. And Chris actually said this, it's not just about the technology anymore. You've got to look for me. I always talk about people, process and technology. You have to have all three of those in place. And I think the culture is so important in this in this environment that everybody understands that they have their bit to play when it comes to a security point of view. So I just wanted to share some of that IDC research there as well. And I think having said this and talking about the transformation, it really does mean that we need to think about security differently and we need to apply new principles to security. And you may have heard this thrown around quite a bit, the zero trust model or zero trust principle. It's not specific to Microsoft. It's a cybersecurity principle. And most people are thinking about how they adopt this. They may not be calling it zero trust, but if we think about it, there's three specific ways in which we look at this. So the first one is to verify explicitly. And in this model, we say we don't trust anything. We want to make sure that we explicitly verify who you are as an individual, making use of the data points that we can. Your login, your password, whether you use things like Windows Hello Biometrics, the quality of the device from an update point of view, where, where it is, um, where are you in the world or where should you be in the world, IP address, geolocation. So that's what we mean by verify explicitly. So if I know that Colin Erasmus is in Johannesburg and he works from here, if I get a log on uh, attempt from Hong Kong, I know that that's most really not Colin Erasmus. So I'm not going to apply an MFA or conditional access to verify explicitly. So that's what we mean by that. Um, the next one is to use least privilege. So don't make everything open. We, what we want to do is we want to do just in time. So make sure that we are using least privileged. So only what you need to do the job function when you need it at a point in time. That is critical. And then the third one for us is to always assume that you're working under breach condition. Um, for most of it, for most of us, it's going to happen at some time um, if it hasn't happened already to you. Um, and I think that's the psyche is how do we work within this environment that we're assuming a breach all the time. So this is the zero trust principle. There's technologies that sit behind each of each of these pillars. Uh, very specifically, we won't get them in today, but if you are thinking about a security strategy for your for your business, it's a nice way to start thinking about it at a at a high level. Um, then what I what I want to show you is, and I'll, I'll skip the slide, I want to show you the, the four major pillars that we look at um, to help accomplish what this is. And, and a lot of the technology solutions from Microsoft, from, from, from the Braintree and the Vox team are within these four pillars. The first one is identity and access management. Don't think we need to speak too much more about that. You know, that comes with a lot of the solution sets, uh, Active, Active, Di Active uh, Directory, Azure Active Directory, et cetera, et cetera. Threat protection, that is critical. And I think what is critical from a threat protection point of view is that it's an automated intelligent threat protection solution that you're looking at. Um, there's no way that any individual today can have a look at all the signals that are coming in. Information protection, exceptionally critical nowadays with Poppy. Um, you guys have all seen it. You've seen the public breaches that have that have been made available. The regulators completely overrun at the moment. So information protection, very critical when we think about it. Even think about things like Teams. And in the financial industry, um, we look at this very specifically where they are very highly regulated and we find that they good DLP processes in place, data loss prevention, but then they don't do it on Teams as an example. And they allow people to share things on Teams, so a client's financial information or their account numbers um, and block everything else. So we need to think about it holistically. And then cloud security for me is critical. Um, cloud is inherently more secure 100% because that provider will take care of a lot of the things, but uh, we, we can't go, it's not done. There's a lot of people in the cloud now. There's a lot of people in multiple clouds and we need to think about how we how we deal with that. So those are the four ways we like to think about it from a, from a bucketing point of view. Talk about information protection just for a second. This world has also drastically changed for us. And in fact, if you look online, we talk about the new oil. They talk about data as being the new oil, and it truly is like that. If we use our data in the correct way, we we can really, the, the world is our oyster, and we can really go and, and um, 
uh, interrogate our data, put AI models on our data and see where the next logical purchase is or the next logical sale for our customers, identify risks before they happen. Um, and I think it's important that we do use our data and I think a lot of people get scared. And I think we need to make sure that we're using data um, in the right way, but we need to make sure that we're protecting that data at the same time because it is one of the biggest assets that you do have uh, as an organization. Inside a risk, as an, as an example, is, is a big one. Stopping people from copying data onto memory sticks, as an example, and disseminating that data. Having a look, by the way, one of the things that we look at internally at Microsoft is if somebody is leaving the organization and has tendered their resignation, is to have a look at things like how is the data leaving the organization, the files that the individual have access to? Are they all of a sudden sending these things to their personal email address or their personal OneDrive accounts or trying to put them on memory sticks? These are all sorts of things that we need to think about. And inside a risk, by the way, it happens 90% of the time not negligently it happens by accident and these are just things that we need to that we need to be thinking about how do we think about it just as a as a quick model um, because sometimes it is a bit daunting especially if you've got a lot of data already it's e easier to do it if you're creating data and you're starting but most of us will have a lot of data already but the first one is knowing your data is understanding what data you have that's the key point. It's critical. Understand whether you've got very sensitive information, understand whether you've got information that could be publicly available, so we don't really care too much about it. We need to look after it, but if somebody gets it, it's okay. Um, that's the first thing, is understanding what data you have. And then once you understand the data that you have is how do you protect it? So I don't want to take a piece of publicly available information, so information that may be on my website, and go and apply encryption to that. That's mostly not necessary. But if I've got health records or if I've got PII, so I've got um, addresses of uh, individual or ID numbers, I, I want to apply a different set of security criteria and technologies to that. And then the, the third one is data loss prevention. How do I think about um, preventing the loss of the specific data that I have? And then the last one is governance of the data because this thing does go in circles. You, you can't do this once and then go, it's finished. Um, and the guys at, uh, at Braintree and Vox have got the solution sets to actually help you do a lot of this, the e-discovery of the data you had and the protection thereof, including the governance. We spoke about the security posture. There's a compliance posture within Compliance Manager, so a tool that most of you will mostly have access to if you have an 0365 tenant, where you can go and have a look at your client posture or your current posture against the set of rules. There's a baseline assessment that you can go and do and perform yourself. Um, this was also from the IDC survey, so just to wrap up from a data point of view, we we asked customers about the readiness around Popier and the protection of, of personal information. Now, this was done in the last six months. Remember, 50% of customers said to us that they'd either failed or only have a basic level of compliance against Popier. So we see this on a daily basis. Um, it's not something that's easy to deal with. You've got to take it uh, from, a, from a methodic point of view, um, but it is doable and you, you can definitely do it, but it starts with knowing the data and what data you have inside your organization. And these really are the technologies as I said, that we that we think about. So information protection and governance is, is, is exactly what it says, is how do we protect and govern that data, but wherever it lies. So remember, we now mostly have data sitting on people's PCs. We've got data sitting maybe on on-prem servers. We've got data sitting in the cloud. So we need to think about it uh, across that, uh, that, that remit. Inside of risk management, we've also spoken about that. How do we make sure that we cover it from somebody trying to steal data from inside our organization? Um, how do we discover and respond? So once something has potentially happened, um, in many instances, you will need things like litigation hold. So if somebody has done something, how do I make sure that that person's mailbox has been secured and that they're not able to tamper with that mailbox, as an example, because I might start getting subpoenas and I may, I may need to be providing that data to legal authorities. Um, so we need to think about that as well. And then compliance management, how do we make sure we've got a compliance management strategy across, across our organization? So just some of the solution sets and some of the thinking at the end of the day. Um, then just as a as a summary before I go to the last two topics, um, you'll see it there. So uh, cloud transformation happening in a big way, accelerating. We're going to see a big acceleration in the next 18 months. Um, in fact, two years ago, we, we, we saw, I mean, our CEO coined it. He said we saw about two years worth of digital transformation or cloud transformation within a two-month period, and we tr truly saw that. Security transformations, yeah, now skilling is a big thing for us. We need to think about that. Um, and then regulatory compliance. That's not going to change for us. That's something that we need to deal with. And then just two things. Windows 11 
if you haven't looked at it, it's something to look at. Um, it is the most secure operating system. A lot of what we've spoken about now, a lot of it is between the hardware and the software layer as well. Windows 11 gets a, gives us a lot of that um, from a chipset point of view, obviously with the right hardware. So just something to, to think about. Uh, and then the last thing that I do just want to also say, and you'll see the link at the bottom, I'm sure we'll, sh we'll, sh I'm sure we'll share this. Microsoft just released the Cyber Sig Signals uh, survey. We do this every year. It's a very, very interesting read that shows you where some of the major uh, data points are in the cybersecurity world. And you'll see one of the major outcomes from that is once again, identity and how we look after our identity. So that's it from myself. Um, Doug, thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity. It's always great to speak to people. And um, yeah, thank you. Back to you, Doug. Thank you very much, Colin. Let me just uh, stick up the next slide, guys. We won't be too long in so far as this goes. So again, uh, handing over to myself. Um, I want to just talk to you guys a little bit around some of the stuff that's come out of these discussions. I think it's more so like a close out. I'm going to combine the two together uh, or else we are going to overrun and I hate to go to webinar overrun. So let's start off here. You've heard a secure score. It's a great place to start. So what are we going to do about this? Well, let's first figure out what the prerequisites are. Let's go to where we need to go to have a quick view of where we are in our secure score stance. What do we need to look at and what do we need to fix? And then why are we doing this? Well, let's start off here. The prerequisites are pretty simple. Any M365 Azure or D365 subscription. It doesn't matter whether it's the lowly little bit like an exchange online plan or the more complex environments like the Microsoft Dynamics 365 uh, Enterprise Resource Planning and Customer Relation Management um, uh, product sets. If you have a tenant with Microsoft and you have the minimum role as security administrator or global administrator or anywhere along that continuum insofar as being able to understand your security posture, you will be able to generate yourself a secure score. As simple as this, and we will share this afterwards. Click on the link. Sign in with your credentials. As long as you have the right role, you will be shown this. It's the Microsoft Secure Score. It generates a security score for you on a daily basis. Colin spoke about the automated uh, ability utilizing, uh, let's call it AI, machine learning, and all those components that pulls in the information based on what you have currently in your environment to be able to give you a roadmap of what you need to fix. If you're sitting on a secure score like this customer, please call us. It's time that you take the security a little bit more seriously and you start putting and implementing in place some stuff to assist yourself. Very simply put, the improvement actions are listed for you. So there are simple things that you can do like turn on multi-factor authentication. There are some ways in which you write policy utilizing your Active Directory in order to close down and secure your links that are sent across mail everywhere in your organization. You can turn on more policies and write more policies into your tenant in order to save yourself. Please take this seriously. Why are we looking at this? You've got to start somewhere with your security transformation process. This is a great place to start. It's a great place to highlight to management. It's a great place to take seriously as uh, as Exco, as a director, to be able to start off and go, I have got a baseline. I've got a starting point on which I need to, to, to execute on. The recommendations will come in and you must implement the recommendations in order to secure yourself. That will lead to improving your score and it will reduce the risk. I suppose just from a muck around perspective, you can also brag to your mates that you're more secure than what they are. That is not the begin all and end all. The idea is yeah, that if you um, if you want um, if you want to 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 be serious about this, the idea is to start off at this very free tool that's given to you as a starting point. You can then go and create the additional um, uh, or utilize the additional advice that's given to you over the period of over the period of time 
um, because it will learn as you put on more and more security aspects, it will learn more and more uh, components and it will start making recommendations. Those recommendations will be built into things like find the secure score, implement the recommendations, and it will go, have you got Active Directory in place? No, get it. Are you looking at Microsoft Endpoints uh, security as a component of your strategy? If not, get it. Have you got Defender for Office in place? If not, look at it, get it. Have you got additional cloud resources that are not and do not form part of your Azure environment like AWS hybrid clouds? If not, get something like Azure Arc in order to incorporate that into your strategy, into your score and fix what is recommended in that space. Have a look at what Defender for Cloud can offer you uh, as part of this. Introduce Sentinel. These things will all be take will will all be recommended as part of your roadmap in order for you to become uh, successful. People we have almost run out of time, so I'd like to ask you to post your questions and answers into this event. We will get back to you. We shall talk to you about that. I'm going to post uh, about nine or ten questions. Um, at the end of this session, we'll answer those uh, questions relevant to this session um, and circulate them for you as part and parcel of the all up distribution of this uh, of this environment. So I'm going to skip the q and I want to get to the next steps. We will run some more sessions. Our next session will be the 30th uh, of March. We will pick a subject matter. Please join us. Our purpose here is to engage our purpose here is to inform and our purpose here is to assist our customers in terms of learning what to do as steps in their technology uh, drive. Uh, to that end, I'd like to thank you and I'd like to close off the session and ask you to please join us uh, in our next event. Um, for those customers that are still a little confused around the new commercial experience of the notifications and things that we sent out, please reach out to your account manager or reach out to me more than happy to take you through what we need to be doing in that space now in order to secure our licensing at a good rate. Thank you very, very much for your time, and I'm going to sign off. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.